Okay, so now we've prepared the images in Adobe Lightroom. I'm going to go give you an introduction into the workflow required for changing uh, the images into a 3D model in Agisoft Photoscan. Just before we import any, any images though, it's important that under the Tools uh, menu bar in Preferences, we activate the GPU to improve processing power. So select the graphics card, apply and OK. And that's really the only one of the main settings we need to change from default. The next thing we need to do is bring some images in. So if I just press this icon in the corner to add a new chunk, currently this displays no cameras and each of the images in Agisoft is regarded as a camera. So right click, add photos and import the high contrast images. Select all and open. And you'll see all of the images be populated in the photos panel at the bottom of the screen. Once the images have loaded in, what we need to do is go to workflow align photos. Because I haven't got many photographs, I'm going to choose the high option, even though at this stage it's, it's quite um, useful just to use medium. But I'll be using high because I've not got too many photographs. So I'll just say OK. And I'll just pause this uh, process while it calculates and inform me of how long it took when it's finished. OK, so it took about five or so minutes to process and align all the images and, pre and create a, uh, a sparse point cloud. So this is what the result we're left with. Now each of these blue squares has been calculated from the images and is, is a representation of where I was stood when I took each of the different images around a tree. This is calculated from corresponding points between different sets of images. But as we can see if we zoom out it's also captured lots of re uh, reference points in a, a wide area that we're not actually interested in because everything it sees it's uh, seen in more than one image so ideally we don't want all that information so if you just press the camera icon at the top of the toolbar it'll actually turn off the camera so we can see a bit more what we're doing we can select the center object which is a tree which we're mainly interested in and actually select the crop tool and that will remove everything except the, the chosen area. So if we crop that, we can now see we're just left with the information required. If however though you wanted to keep all the external area selected or available for, other, for, for processing rather than actually deleting the faces, you could select this tool which is Region size, resize region, and actually move the size, move the bounding box in closer, and it will only actually calculate what's within inside the box rather than deleting verts if they may be required at a later point. But for this example, we'll just leave it as it as it is. So just zoom in. As we can see, with the, with a sparse, dense cloud, it's actually quite difficult to see exactly what information you've got. So it looks like it's pretty done a pretty good representation. But I just want to show an example of, of what will be calculated with a, a dense point cloud and the, the results. So once this has been generated, all we need to do now is workflow build dense cloud and again I'll just use uh, well I'll use medium this time advanced aggressive that's fine so okay and again I'll pause the video and uh, tell you how long it took when it's finished so to generate the dense point cloud has taken roughly about three and a half minutes 
and you can see it doesn't look any particularly different because we're not actually on the right tab. Now the toolbar, the first one represents the sparse point cloud, the next one is a dense point cloud. So if we select this one, you can see automatically there's more information being provided. And this is, as if we zoom in, you can just see it's literally points in space. That's what it's referencing. Now from the from the um, sparse point cloud, when we first saw it, we could see, oh, it, it was a, uh, it seemed like it was actually following the outline of the tree pretty well. We go to the dense point cloud and see there's lots and lots of um, artifacts that we don't actually need. And this is where it becomes quite important to consider doing masks, especially if you're doing um, an object in, a, in the middle of a location. Now, the mask can be produced in Photoshop as a black and white uh, mask level, mask layer, and imported in. Alternatively, you can actually create um, masks within Agisoft. So, I'll show you the process of bringing the images in first. So, if we just right click on an image, say import masks from file. Because they've already been, some of them have already been created and to all selected cameras. Now it's important to make sure you've got the right file format at the end because if it doesn't, it just it just basically won't won't find them or it, it'll we'll look for an image and it won't load them in. So if we go OK, head to the mask folder which I've already pre pre uh, generated, and go open. And if we click on the mask tab in the photos panel. These only ones shown is because when I've said import masks, I've had selected camera and not all cameras. So just do that again. Trees, masks, and just select the folder it was in. And then we'll import in all the different masks for the corresponding JPEG file. The only thing you have to be careful of is you actually have to call it the same file format underscore mask and then it will reference the same files. So you can see that some have been generated and some haven't. So for instance this one there which is number 75 just give you a quick example of how you can generate masks with inside um, Agisoft Photoscan. We have to go to um, lasso tool, select a point, just click in, and if you hold down control, the lasso will uh, give a, an effect which is similar, similar to the magnetic tool in Photoshop. And it'll try to click, try to follow the, the pixel line as best as possible. For instance, if it kind of goes off track, all you've got to do is just move back and click again with the mouse to make sure you have like a solid anchor point and then continue drawing. So if I just go across, down, so this is only rough as a quick example. And then come back to the other end. What I need to do now is invert the selection. So this is invert, so press that option and then we need to add the subtraction, add the selection. Once we select this, we can see that everything else has been greyed out and this is the only part, the part that Agisoft will actually uh, calculate. You can hold V to move around the screen as well once, you, once um, you've closed the marquee tool. So to do the next section, Go back to the lasso, click on a point, hold down control, follow the contours as best as possible. Follow the other side and just join it up. Now this time we actually need to subtract the selection because this is already unmasked. So we subtract it and we got the next section. Now this we just kind of continue doing 
all the way to the top of the tree until the entire tree is selected. Now important thing to remember is Agisoft has the ability to bring in separate chunks of different parts of photographs so you don't have to do um, one set of photographs at a time and there's the ability to align different chunks and then merge them into a bigger image. So if I went through the whole process of doing all these masks and then do another chunk, I don't know whether it's a bug or just the way that Agisoft is, is uh, configured, but as I go between the two different chunks, the actual masks, the masks I've made within Agisoft will just be deleted. They just disappear. So it's important that if you're doing it within Agisoft, you, once they're done, you right click and say export masks to a set directory. And then if anything happens, you've also got a backup which you can kind of re-import re in. So that's something to consider if you are using multiple chunks. I'll just reset this mask anyway because it's not really uh, needed because we've got quite a lot of information in the rest of the masks. As you can see from this. So now what I want to do is go back to the model and recalculate the dense. Uh, okay. I'll just pause the video again. So the processing for the dense uh, point cloud is now finished and as we can see due to the mask being applied the actual finish and the uh, calculation is a lot more accurate than previously um, than we saw previously. Now obviously there's holes in some of the some areas of the map in some areas of the model and this is purely where the photographs didn't exist so it's only ever going to take uh, recreate the recreate the surface which was visible in the photographs. We still have a little bit of um, excess stuff that we don't need and this can be simply deleted by selecting any of the selection tools with the, the square, the circle or the lasso, highlighting it and deleting. So just refine this a little bit more, lasso tool just delete. So now we're ready to actually generate a model because this is still only made up of points in a dense point cloud. Next stage then, workflow, build mesh. We can do this at low, medium or high. I'll try the high version and under advanced settings what we want to do is extrapolated and what extrapolated will do is actually kind of cap all the holes and make it more of a solid mesh so we'll just click OK and I'll pause the video again OK so that process took about 1 minute 30 and now we're still viewing the point cloud so we need to change the view mode we can select the shaded version next to the point cloud and we now see a solid mesh. Now this looks blurry because currently this is just referencing vertex colors. So if we look at the wireframe, all these points are just referencing colors that is picked up from the photographs and applied to the mesh. So that's why it looks really blurry. But as I said, with the extrapolation, all the holes that were there, uh, previously there have now been capped if we see the wireframe we can just see exactly how much detail has been created from the photos and generated into the model. So now the model has been generated the next thing is to actually create a texture based on all the camera, port, all the camera viewports which will then be mapped onto the model. So this is under workflow again and build texture. Now here you have the opportunity to do uh, different size textures. At default it's 4K and that's what I'll just leave out for the time being. And just press OK and I'll pause the video again. Right, so the process of generating the texture has taken roughly about a minute. This is pretty fast because there's only 43 textures and uh, the more and more images you have, the more cameras, etc., the longer the processing time is going to be. So there is like a tolerance between having just enough and too many 
in terms of speed and efficiency. So to just jump back to uh, the vertex lit version or vertex shaded version, not a great representation. Click on the textured version and it's pretty much accurate to the photographs we actually loaded in. So now this has been calculated, the next thing we need to do is actually export the model. This can be done by going to File, Export Model, I'll save a new folder, Export, and save it as OBJ. And also at this point it allows you to save the texture out as well, so we'll use it as a JPEG. Now if I just jump to the file we exported, I just want to show the texture to begin with. And we can see how it's not really workable. It doesn't leave any any seams or issues on the actual model but if we actually wanted to go in and work with this it's pretty unworkable really so the next stage is to take it into an external software such as ZBrush re UV layout the model and then re-import it in so that'll be the next process I'll be covering